Okay, so by my time, it's five o'clock. Everyone, I know that there are still some attendees entering, so we will just crack on. So welcome to this webinar in celebration of World Right to Die Day. And to start us off, we have a word of welcome from Sean Davison, who is the president of the World Federation of Right to Die Societies. So over to you, Sean. Thank you. Greetings from Cape Town, South Africa, to this truly global event. Uh, guten Tag, bonjour, uh, uh, ni hao, kuyanant, and Mexico, buenos dias. But a very special g'day to New Zealand. I'd like to take the opportunity to congratulate New Zealand on three days ago confirming the new law to allow for assisted dying was passed by 65% in the national referendum. Truly wonderful work by our members in New Zealand. Congratulations. Hopefully, this new law will be a stepping stone to going beyond the suffering of terminally ill. So good luck in that next campaign. Today, we celebrate the World Federation Right to Die Day. It started in 2008 in Paris, and in 2016, it became the World Federation Day for all our member societies. We use the opportunity to encourage discussion in the public and much debate and awareness. Today, we're going to have a global webinar, a wonderful way to mark this day. It's linking all our countries at one time and quite appropriate this year when we were denied our conference in Mexico due to coronavirus. I'd like to thank the organizing committee. They did an exceptional job. It seems easy organizing a webinar, but no, extremely complex, and they did a fantastic job. So I now invite you in the comfort of your own living rooms to put up your feet, pour yourself a drink, enjoy a relaxing evening and a very fascinating discussion. Thank you, Amanda. Thanks very much for that, Sean. So just a few housekeeping things to start off with. We are recording today's session, and I'll give you some information at the end of the webinar as to how you can access that. I would encourage attendees to post questions during the webinar. So if you look at the right-hand side of your screen, you will see a drop-down bar that says questions. If you click on this, you can post your questions there and we will um, give them to our distinguished panelists when we come to the Q&A later on. But now we're going to see a short clip by filmmaker Paula Rappelfort, who has made a short documentary. So Paula is a writer, director, and filmmaker, and she's won many um, awards for her, for her work. She's a recipient of a Guggenheim Foundation Fellowship two-time NYFA Fellow, Emmy nominee, and winner of numerous grants and awards. Paula is a Fellow of the Yaddo Artist Colony 2019 and a graduate of NYU Teach School of Arts, where she teaches editing. So I'll hand over to you now, Paula. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I thought I just lost my camera. Thank you so much, Amanda and uh, Sean, Stephanie, Thaddeus, and uh, Jane Barrett, who, who organized this, this incredible seminar. Um, I'm really honored to be here. Um, I'm going to be showing just a five minute preview excerpt of a film which is still in progress called Champion. It's the full title is Champion, the Death and Life of Marika Vervoort. I'm sure many of you know something about Paralympic champion Marika Vervoort. Uh, she won gold in London 2012 in the Paralympics and won two more silver and bronze uh, medals in Rio in 2016, and then decided that it was time after many, many years of suffering since the age of 14 from a degenerative uh, spinal condition that she would quit top sports. But what is unique about Marika's story and what really captivated me when I decided to spend four years of my life so far working on this project uh, was the fact that Marika, having gotten the permission 
to choose for medical aid in dying um, had 12 years of confidence building and uh, professional growth and personal growth she had the confidence and she gained the courage to become a world champion in that period after she had arranged eventually to have medical aid in dying and she was able to put it off for 12 years during which she became a paralympic champion twice i thought her story was so extraordinary because of the effect of being able to choose and that's what really caught my attention and caught my my uh, desire to do a feature length documentary so this is only five minutes of clips from it to give you a taste and i'm so excited to be able to be showing it thank you all um here we go thanks Thank you so much for sharing that with us, Paula. Although it's just a short piece, it's extremely powerful and is a reminder of the emotional assurance, insurance that assisted dying provides that is so well documented and, and the film really articulates that well. It's also a reminder that although assisted dying is an autonomous choice for the individual, that autonomy is relational. And I think that you've really captured very sensitively how um, these decisions impact on others. So could you just let us know the status of the film, Paula? When can we hope to see it in full? And if you have any plans to take it to film festivals or anything? Oh, Amanda, thanks very much. Um, well, the status is that I'm in the middle of editing, um, working with a young editor, um, and it's a long process. Uh, so the shooting is completed. We shot for about three years with Marika from when my husband, my husband is an Emmy award-winning cinematographer, Wolfgang Held. We met Marika after the Rio Olympics in at the end of 2016. And we filmed until through her death on October 22nd last year, 2019. We have a treasure trove of material to edit from. And I do think that her story is a microcosm that really puts a personal touch on the whole movement. So I think it will become a groundbreaking film when we're able to complete it. Um, there's a lot of interest in it uh, from streaming services, Netflix and Amazon and uh, HBO and others. But I need, uh, at the moment, I need um, completion funding. I have uh, gotten a grant from the New York State Council on the Arts, which has been incredibly prestigious and and for which we are extremely grateful. That funding's running out by the end of the year, and in order to keep editing, uh, we need funding. So if anyone in the audience who has an interest in seeing the film completed has contacts or as individuals themselves or groups could, can contribute to this project, we would be extremely grateful. We do have a tax-exempt uh, uh, sponsor in America for American funding. I hope the film will be completed by mid 2019. And, uh, and then we are planning for uh, one of the major festivals, either Sundance where I've shown before or possibly uh, Amsterdam International Documentary Film Festival to premiere the film. But um, I think her story will make an enormous impact on the public. And I hope that it will change the conversation. I think that was what Marika wanted with her life, and uh, I hope the film will promote her her vision. So, but thank you so much, Amanda, for the opportunity. And my, if you do want to, if you're interested in contributing, anyone out there, please contact me at polarap at gmail.com. It's p o l a r a p at gmail.com, and I think my contact info will be in the written material related to the seminar. But thank you so much. Yeah. Okay, we'll make sure that that information is, is sent around everyone. And thanks again for that, Paula. So next, I am going to introduce our guest panelists. Um, most of you will probably already know who they are, but I'll give them a short introduction. So first of all, we have Stephanie. 
and Dr. Stephanie Green is the co-founder and current president of the Canadian Association of Maid Assessors and Providers, known as CAMAP. She is medical advisor to the BC Ministry of Health, Maid Oversight Committee and moderator of CAMAP's national online forum. Dr. Green spent 10 years in general practice and another 12 years working exclusively in maternity and newborn care. She changed her focus in 2016 and now spends the majority of her clinical time in and around assisted dying. Stephanie is based in Victoria, BC and enjoys speaking about MAID to the public, to healthcare communities and to a wide range of audiences locally, nationally and internationally. And Stephanie is clinical faculty at UBC and UVic. So Stephanie is going to give us a short talk now for about eight minutes. Over to you, Stephanie. Thanks, Amanda. Thanks to everyone for inviting me to join you today. I think after this powerful video, I, I also want to express my gratitude for Marika for her courage, for opening up her story and her life uh, and her death to such a wide audience. Uh, thanks to her family for their support of her process and to Pola for this uh, very powerful production and for taking the issue of assisted dying to a, to a wider audience. Certainly many of us on this meeting today support the concept of an individual having a right to choose the terms of their death at the end of their life. In Canada, of course, where I live and work, uh, as in the Benelux countries, the core of our care, the model of assisted dying that we have built, was not intended to be strictly an end-of-life regime but a model of care based on the patient. Um, it is patient-centered, patient-driven care, and the core of eligibility in our country remains the suffering of the patient. I say this because as some of you may know, our law in Canada currently requires a person to be on what we call a trajectory towards their natural death, but that eligibility requirement is about to be removed from our law, which will pave the way for people like Marika who are clearly suffering, but whose natural death is not imminent, to become eligible for assisted dying in our jurisdiction. This, of course, is not true anywhere in the United States or Australia or now New Zealand, where a terminal illness with a prognosis of six months or less is required to be considered eligible for care. Marika's story then is particularly interesting to me and I expect to many of us, but I'm, I'm not here today to talk about the intricacies of laws or even as an advocate for assisted dying. Of course, on a personal level, I am, but I'm here today as a clinician as an assessor and provider of this care. And it's my job to work to the best of my ability to the highest of medical standards within the law of the land, whatever that law may be. And as I talk with you today, I bring with me my personal experience of doing this work for over four and a half years now. I'm a bit of an oddity in that assisted dying occupies 90% of my clinical work. I no longer run a general practice of any sort. But this is what I do. And over these past four and a half years, I've had the deep privilege of assisting over 200 people to end their life. What I want to emphasize to you today, what this story reminds me of, is the importance of being the, given the opportunity, the power of the choice itself, the value of the words of being told you are able to access this care if you wish or feel the need to. So I have known this since the early days of my work, but a few weeks ago, I had an experience with a young woman that reminded me of this, and I thought I would share it briefly with you. So I recently met this young woman who I'll call Vicky, who had a nine year history of experience with a very slow growing recurring malignant brain tumor. She had neurosurgery to remove the bulk of her tumor, followed by several rounds of chemotherapy and then radiation to the brain and followed by a time of remission until her disease ultimately came back. And she went through this complete cycle of surgery, chemotherapy and radiation three times over the course of nine years, declining in health each time, of course, until her most recent recurrence, uh, which occurred in, in new locations that were inoperable uh, and no treatments were left to offer her. She knew that she was dying and she declined further and so she made a request for an assisted death. Vicky was quite young, she was actually in her 40s. Uh, she was quite frustrated at the lack of control she had over her illness and therefore over her life. And independence remained extremely important for her. She was supported by her family, but she lived very proudly alone until her final two weeks of life. She began to decline very quickly and her family practitioner assessed her as eligible for assisted dying according to our process. And I was asked to become involved as a second required clinician and as the provider of the care itself if she ever wished to proceed. By the time I met Vicky, 
and we did this over the computer due to the COVID pandemic, it was fairly recently, Vicki was bed bound with fatigue and illness. She was drowsy from her pain medication and she was in need of uh, full care, but she was still very capable of making her own healthcare decisions. I informed Vicki she was eligible for assisted dying and I'm also known for my very direct talk. So without encouraging her in any direction, I also explained to Vicki that I suspected her decline would continue and that her window of opportunity to make this particular decision might be closing. But what I chose to really reinforce with her was that she was in fact eligible for an assisted death if and when she ever wished to pursue one. And I asked her about her intentions. She clearly stated she was not yet ready to set a date, but that she would consider her options and that we should speak again soon. And she asked that I call her back in a week's time, so I readily agreed. But I honestly wondered if she would live that long. That had, of course, been on Friday afternoon when we'd spoken, and I couldn't help myself. So three days later on Monday morning, I called her sister to quietly ask how things were going. And she thanked me for my call and said how timely it was because she'd been planning to call me later that same morning. In fact, her sister had died that morning at 5 a.m. peacefully in her bed. But what she really wanted to tell me was not that, but what had happened after our meeting three days earlier. She told me Vicky had looked at her immediately after our talk and said, now I have the choice. Yes, her sister had agreed, you do, it's up to you now. It's up to me, Vicky repeated back to her. And she smiled and closed her eyes and dozed off. She never opened her eyes again, the sister said to me. She was so relieved, she said, so not, not afraid anymore, so able to let go after that talk. She said, I cannot thank you enough. You gave her that peace of mind. And that's really what I wanna tell you today. That is what compels me to keep doing this work. That's the part that I find the most rewarding. It's the ability to inform someone that they're eligible, that this option exists for them, whether they make use of it or not, that it's possible. The value of that possibility cannot be overstated. I am convinced such a conversation as I had with Vicki is an objectively therapeutic intervention in and of itself. So I'm happy to be here today with you. I'm happy to chat with you about any aspect of my work or my experience. And I thank, thank you for your attention. Thanks so much for that, Stephanie. Again, you've articulated really well the emotional insurance aspect that having the choice gives to people. We are going to move next to the day's poll, but I would just encourage people to continue to post your questions in the question section. And once the day's has given his talk, we will move to a Q&A. So Thaddeus Pope is a law professor and bioethicist who uses the law both to improve medical decision making and to protect patient rights at the end of life. He is director of the Health Law Institute and a professor at Mitchell Hamlin School of Law in St. Paul, Minnesota, USA. Before joining academia, Thaddeus was an attorney for seven years with Arno and Porter in Los Angeles and Washington, D.C. He clerked on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Seventh Circuit, and he's going to give us a short talk now before we move to the Q&A. Thank you, Amanda. I'm really humbled to join Stephanie and Paula and Sean, right, who are uh, change makers, and I'm just a legal academic. But I want to make three observations about the availability of end-of-life options. So point number one. The film that we just watched about Marika Vervoet was based in Belgium. And Belgium is one of the very few jurisdictions anywhere in the world where euthanasia is legally available. Only in Belgium, the Netherlands, Luxembourg, Colombia, and Canada can a clinician at the request of a seriously ill patient provide a lethal injection. Right, as we heard this week, there's been a lot of discussion about New Zealand, rightly so. The New Zealand law that takes effect in a year in November 2021 permits assisted dying that is both patient administered and clinician administered. But contrast that with many other states, many other laws in other jurisdictions. They are more limited, right? For example, in Switzerland, the United States, Australia, don't permit euthanasia, right? They permit only MAID or VAD, voluntary assisted death. The patient must herself self-ingest, usually orally. And that's not as effective, it's not as safe. 
Now, fortunately, New Zealand is not alone. Other countries are also moving toward authorizing MAID or euthanasia. Italy, Germany, Spain, additional states in Australia, additional states in the United States. But there's something else. There's another movement that's accelerating, that's spreading. So point number two. Assisted dying is not yes or no, black or white, stop or go. Even within jurisdictions that already now permit MAID or euthanasia, many seriously ill patients are unable to access it, often because they're unable to satisfy either eligibility conditions or onerous safeguards. In response, Many jurisdictions are relaxing their eligibility conditions and safeguards. As, as Stephanie noted, perhaps most notable is, is Canada, but even in the United States, some states have already moved to waive the uh, mandatory 15-day waiting period. Some states are moving to expand the prescribing and consulting roles to be filled not only by physicians, but also by advanced practice registered nurses, APRNs. Some states are moving to expand the definition of terminal illness from six months to 12 months and even beyond. So in sum, there is a renewed focus on not only legal permissibility, but also on practical availability. And then point number three, even with these new moves to expand access, made in euthanasia will remain out of reach to many interested individuals. Many who would like to access made or euthanasia will be unable, either because it's illegal in their jurisdiction, or even if it is a legal option, they can't qualify. So therefore, for this population, it's important to draw more attention to alternative end-of-life options. And most notable among them is VSED, V-S-E-D, voluntarily stopping eating and drinking. When supervised by palliative care professionals, death by dehydration can be peaceful and comfortable. Growing published medical research, especially from the Netherlands and Switzerland shows that the prevalence of VSED rivals that of made in euthanasia, at least in those countries. VSED is already legal in most countries. There's no need to pass a law through parliament. But we lack guidance from government regulators or even from private medical associations. Clinicians don't like to act in the face of uncertainty. So right to die organizations like those on this webinar should continue to work on expanding the menu of end of life options, but they should work concurrently to clarify options like VSED that are already on the menu, that are already legally permissible, but not yet practically available. Thank you. Thanks so much for that, Thaddeus. Um, you're absolutely right in what you're saying. This is an option, a legal option, and probably most of the jurisdictions that people have come to um, on this webinar today. I think the main issue for right to die societies and lobbyists is that although it is a legal option, it still doesn't align with the wishes and the values of the way that people want to go. I think that people want to go in a way where they have their full capacity. They don't want to sort of dwindle out of life and have, um, you know, healthcare decisions taken when they lose consciousness um, on behalf of, of themselves. So I think that although it's a legal option, it doesn't sort of align with their, the way that they would like to, to go. Um, we do have a list of questions here, so I'm just going to, to kick off. Um, Stephanie, I think this one is directed towards you. How would your participants define their suffering um, and 
does Canada include a dementia diagnosis? So I think what this is getting at is um, how do people articulate their suffering to you? And would people qualify um, for MAID in Canada now if they had dementia or Alzheimer's? You'll have to unmute yourself, Stephanie. That would probably be better. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the question. I think um, like like all, like many, many aspects of end of life care and assisted dying, of course, how people express their suffering and what sort of suffering they're having is a very personal experience. Um, I'll just step back and just state that our law does uh, specifically recognize the suffering that's required to meet eligibility for assisted dying in Canada. It, it can be a physical suffering and it can be a psychological or emotional suffering. So both are perfectly acceptable under the law. And I think um, what, what we've come to understand, what was understood at the beginning and what the community of, of providers of this care understand is that um, suffering is a very individual experience. It's one of the only criteria that's not really up to me as a clinician to design or, or to decide or define. Suffering, um, uh, you know, how, what causes one person's suffering might be quite different than another's. Um, and so it's really up to the patient to explain to me what their suffering is and why it causes them that suffering. And I hear a wide variety of physical and emotional uh, explanations. Our, our law happens to require that the patient is suffering intolerably. And so again, it's not up to me as a clinician to decide how much suffering the patient can endure before it becomes intolerable to them. I have many people who, in the exact same situation with a terminal illness that are on decline, one of them will ask to proceed in a week, and the other one will tell me they'd very much like to proceed, but they're expecting a great grandchild in two and a half weeks, so they'd like to delay three weeks. And so it's not really up to the clinician to decide uh, that definition. That's the one criteria that's really up to the patient. Uh, but with respect to the, the side question about dementia, um, I'll speak frankly, as I always do. I, I don't think that our current law was meant to address that situation, uh, the situation of the patient with dementia, but it's not specifically excluded in our law. And so in Canada, I am one of many, many clinicians that believe that there are patients with dementia that can meet the eligibility criteria of our country um, under the current law. And I have personally helped people in that situation to end their life. So um, it's a nuanced uh, application with a lot of uh, complexity that needs to be followed carefully. But yes, it is possible in our country for people with dementia to get to a state where they meet all of our criteria while they still have capacity to make that decision and to give that permission to go ahead. So that's my brief answer. That's great. Thanks so much, Stephanie. And that's certainly in Scotland's um something that we're advocating for on the basis that if the person can retain and prove that they've got full mental capacity, um, then this option should be open open to them. And that was a, a question from Margot McClear there. So thank you, Margot. Um, I, do you want to come in? Yeah, just briefly, right? I mean, it, now that may be true in Canada, obviously it's not true in many other jurisdictions like in Australia and the United States because you can't, um, you're, you're not going to be terminally ill, right? You're not going to be within six months or 12 months of death. And if you are, then you're no longer going to have capacity. So you can't satisfy the capacity requirement and the terminal illness requirement at the same time. But, but I, and maybe Stephanie will respond to this, but one problem is if you, if you require that a dementia patient still has capacity at the time she takes MAID, arguably she is then hastening her death much earlier than she might have preferred. Um, and, and, and therefore, one thing to consider, which I think is only available in the Netherlands, are advanced requests um, for euthanasia. So, and that, and that, and there have been some recent case, high-profile cases where people in the dementia situation, where somebody says, "I'm okay now, but only when I my, my dementia is far more advanced, that's when I want euthanasia." I can't make a contemporaneous request with capacity at that time, so I'm going to make my advanced request today. I don't know if that's, is that, I mean, I know Canada at least is thinking about that. Yeah, no, no, I think it's an important point. We certainly require our patients to give consent immediately prior to their, their, their made procedure. And I think your point is well taken that, that some of these patients would likely prefer to live a little bit longer until they're truly lacking capacity and deeper into their dementia. They'd like to squeeze every bit of juice out of the orange of life. Um, and so that would be probably an ideal situation, which we don't have available to us yet. 
but um, I think that, I think they're being forced to make a very cruel choice by ending their life while they still have capacity. But uh, the people that I've helped have have specifically looked at that and preferred to do that earlier rather than waiting and losing the option. Of course, Canada will be looking at the possibility of advanced requests somewhere in the next 12 months. We have a, a large review pending, but where that will go and how long that conversation will take is anyone's guess. Yeah, again, for me, it comes down to what's what's possible politically. So you touched on it earlier on, Thaddeus, as well, and that we know that euthanasia is probably clinically the best route to take. Um, it, it takes any any sort of issues out with self-administration, but politically getting that through is a different story and the same, the same goes for advanced requests. You know, I'm just going to add, because I think it's an important other side of this argument. I mean, every talk I give, somebody mentions the topic of dementia and and there's often in many audiences I speak to, there's often a lot of support for the idea of an advanced request. And, and I understand that support, but I'm just gonna say from the perspective of a, of a provider, um, it's actually not such a black and white issue. I mean, I came into this thinking it was a little bit more clear, but the truth is, if we start discussing the options of advanced requests, there's a lot of very practical issues that are very, very complicated. And I don't think we should lose sight of those. For example, whose responsibility will it be to decide that criteria A, B, and C have now been met from that advanced request? You know, to ask the family members to decide that is a conflict of interest for them, specifically if they're inheriting. To ask the physician who's now taking care of the loved one who is perhaps living in a locked facility for their safety, you know, the, the physician in charge of that facility probably didn't know that patient before they were that ill. It's very difficult for them to make the differential between who that person was and who they are now. So it often will fall to the provider of care. Again, it's a very, very difficult decision to make and how you make that decision is is tough and there's a whole gradation of illness in dementing illnesses where people go through an early phase where they still have capacity, a moderate phase where they are clearly in need of more care and not really who they were before, but not yet in that advanced stage, which we all picture with, with um, you know, difficult dementia cases who are, are truly, you know, in a, a, an obviously suffering state where they're, they're, it's a terrible situation. The idea, of course, is that they would receive end-of-life care before they hit that advanced stage. But in that moderate stage, there is a spectrum, and many, many people will not be who they were before they were demented, but they will still be uh, functioning well and socializing, maybe not recognizing their family, but still going to bingo on Wednesdays at 10. It's difficult as the provider to walk in and then offer an assisted death to someone who's still functioning in that way. I mean, it's just not likely to be done. My point is it's not a black and white issue and the discussion has to be very robust and look and drill down into the actual operationalizing of how to do that. It's very difficult. Yeah, it's hugely ethically complex area. So we have a question from Mary Panko now again for Stephanie. Um, would your next step in New Zealand be to set up an official group of medics who can try to work from inside the Ministry of Health? It's a great question. Thanks, Mary. I, um, I'm a little biased, of course. In Canada, um, when the law changed, there was not a lot of support yet in place from federal agencies or, or even, even many of the provincial agencies. Healthcare in Canada is, is administered provincially. What happened in Canada is that physicians and clinicians like myself actually stepped into that void and took the lead on many of the practical issues that needed to happen. So I'm a firm believer that, yes, the next step in a place like New Zealand may well be for clinicians, the few who are willing to do this work, to connect together, to network for support, to build in and learn from other jurisdictions what is best standard practice, what is the highest medical standard, um, how to build in supports for each other to do this work, to build training programs, to, to organize research. Those kinds of um, activities need to happen in the very early days. And if you don't see that happening from the health administration itself, I would urge the clinicians to do that role, which is what happened in Canada. And physicians in Canada continue to play an integral role in the evolution of MAID in our country. Yeah. I'll just throw it, same in the United States, right? In other words, you don't get a lot of guidance from the governments in the 10 states where we have MAID. Um, so we, following basically the model KMAP in Canada last year, actually earlier this year, formed an organization called American Clinicians Academy on Medical Aid and Dying, ACA MAID 
which is where clinicians can share information about you know what drugs to use, what doses, and all all the sorts of more specific things that are not addressed in the law. Thanks for that, Thaddeus. Um, we've got a question for you from Adam Teriakin. Um, is there any states in the US which has specifically authorized voluntary cessation of eating and drinking? Should there be some regulations to at least collect the data? So it, it, it follow, it's definitely allowed in every state so if the patient still has capacity. What's, what's less certain from state to state is whether you can make an advance request for stopping eating and drinking. You, you definitely can in Nevada and Vermont and a few other states. Okay, so, so if, you, if the patient still has capacity, she can definitely make a decision to stop eating and drinking. Less clear if you can make a legally binding advance request for stopping eating and drinking. That's gonna vary from state to state. Um, we don't, this is not studied. It's, it's been a relatively neglected issue, so we don't know the prevalence um, of VSED in the United States. It's, there's much more study, in, as I mentioned, in Switzerland and the Netherlands. Even Japan has more uh, medical literature on VSED than, than we do. So it definitely needs to be studied more. Yeah. Okay, we've got a question from Aubrey Welsh now. She says, thanks everyone for the seminar. And she is a very proud New Zealander who's joining us tonight. Um, she says, what is the current situation and future prognosis with regards to completed life options for non-terminal candidates? So I'll come first to Stephanie for Canada, and then today as you can pick up for the US. Yeah, so just in brief, we are, we are about to remove the eligibility requirement for what we call a reasonably foreseeable death in our law that will be is scheduled to be removed from our federal law in December, which will open the doorway for those uh, who do not have an immediate death um, to apply for this law. But, <coughs> excuse me, we still have a number of eligibility requirements that, will be, that are mandatory, and there's no sense in Canada that somebody who has what they believe is a completed life, uh, your average, let's say, 91-year-old who's still functioning very well, who's decided they've contributed all they want to contribute and is ready to die, there is really no room or space for that in Canadian law. Uh, they still need to uh, meet all the other eligibility criteria, which include things like an advanced state of decline in function and, and, and suffering. So uh, the, the concept of a completed life, um, uh, being eligible for assisted death in Canada, I don't think is on the table for us. So the options for non-terminal patients who want to hasten their death. Well, first, if you're dependent upon any kind of medical treatment, so uh, you know, implantable cardiac device, um, dialysis, mechanical ventilation, artificial nutrition, hydration, right? You can refuse anything. Um, and, and so if you're dependent upon something to sustain your life, you can refuse that, which is actually why VSET is legal, because since you're allowed to always negatively refuse things, if you can refuse all of those things, you can also refuse food and water. And the other thing that I think doesn't get nearly as much attention, because everything we're talking about whether it's VSED or MAID or euthanasia, is medically assisted death. Um, but there is definitely another discussion about non-medically assisted death, right? And so in the United States, we have an organization called Final Exit Network, which um, will, will in, a, in a nutshell, advise you how to use inert gas um, you know, to, to hasten your death. I mean, in Australia, you have Philip Nitschke. I mean, so there are other people who, I guess would promote and educate people on how to use non-medically supervised options to hasten your death. In other words, without a doctor, without a clinician. Yeah, so, so basically the amateur assistance that people have to fall back on in countries which don't have a law that allows this. And that's certainly or, what we Right, or countries that do have laws, but you don't qualify for the law, or you can't find a willing clinician anywhere within 500 miles of where you live. You know, so yeah. even, even within countries where it's technically legally available, it might not be available for you. Yeah, and I think that's something that a lot of people don't realize. We work so hard to change the law, then when the law is passed, there are still these, these access issues. And um, 
could both of you talk? We've had quite a few questions. It's sort of one of the themes that's coming through um, is around self-ingestion versus euthanasia. Um, so Thaddeus and I had mentioned that clinically it's probably more straightforward to have euthanasia, um, but in particular Dignitas um, have contributed to the Q&A to say that in their experience um, that isn't how it is. They have thousands of cases of self-administration with a zero failure rate. Um, so I suppose I could go to you first, Stephanie, um, and if you could maybe just talk a bit to that and also with regard to your patients, who, you know, what's the rate of preference? Is it is it more towards euthanasia or self-ingestion? Yeah, so it's a great question. So we do have we do have both options available in Canada. We have a an oral self-administered drink. So just to be clear, in, in a, a self-administration, the physician would still write the prescription, and in our country, would actually pick up the medication, hand it to the patient, and in the province I work, we would stand by and make sure that it was successful. A patient would self-administer, and we would stand by, and then only step in if there was a problem. Um, that's one option. The other option is the clinician-administered option, where the physician writes the prescription, picks up the medication, takes it to the patient, and actually administers it in an in intravenous route. Um, what we have found initially in our country that uh, there was very little uh, interest in the oral uh, route because a lot of patients preferred to know somebody else was in control of that. Um, and also the medications we had available were less than ideal. We didn't have the medications that were available in Europe. Um, our organization lobbied very hard to find a way to obtain uh, the preferred medication, which we now have available in Canada. We thought that would change interest in it. But the truth is most clinicians have developed their skills uh, towards the clinician administered route. Uh, I'm aware of over 14,000 uh, uh, made deaths in Canada since 2016. And I'm personally aware of, I think, every single oral option. There have been less than 20. Uh, so we're talking 99.9% .9 of administrations in Canada are clinician administered. Uh, so there's a very strong uh, preference for that. My understanding is that as the last time I looked at the data, it, 2015 data out of the Netherlands uh, showed 96% uh, of their of their uh, deaths were also clinician administered. I think in jurisdictions where both options are available, it's clearly preferred by the patients, whether that's for fear or ignorance or practical issues, it does take longer for oral administration. There is a slightly higher failure rate. Um, you have to, uh, you know, address the technical issues of being able to sit up, to be able to hold the drink, to drink it, to swallow it, to be able to digest it comfortably and not regurgitate it up. Switzerland is a bit of an outlier in that they have the ability to administer in some facilities, uh, I don't know actually about Dignitas, but in some places in Switzerland, where it is, of course, only allowed to be self-administered, they have uh, hooked up systems that are intravenous based, but the patient can hit the stopcock. And so they can have a self-administered intravenous death. So I think there's some compromises that maybe could be beneficial in other jurisdictions, which we don't have available. And that might change who chooses to do a self-administration or not. But in my experience, there's an enormous preference for clinician administered uh, deaths. Uh, so uh, Stephanie made all the right points. I think the, the thing that I guess to maybe emphasize is that when we say self-administration, that that that's not a single thing, right? Because there's self-administration that's supervised by a clinician, which obviously is one thing, and then there's self-administration orally or self-administration by IV. And so I think when we talk about, at least from the U.S. data, a, a, a significant rate of side effects, things like people waking back up, people regurgitating, things like that, that's because it's A, orally ingested, and B, normally there's no clinician there at the time that the patient does it. Um, if you change either of those two things, it definitely becomes safer. It can be self-administered and through an IV, which I think is, yes, as Stephanie said, something that they can, you can do in Switzerland. So I think you have to make those more uh, fine-grained uh, distinctions about the specific mode of self-administration. Yeah. And, and whilst we're on the, the topic of um, the question was posed from Dignitas there, we know that Dignitas are crippling under the pressure of requests from all over the world. Um, and they do an absolutely sterling job trying to facilitate them, you know, the best that they can. Is there any movement in Canada in particular, Stephanie, um, to allow this to non-residents? There's absolutely no movement towards that, and I expect will never be. Okay. And the same in, in the USA today, yeah. 
Well, it's actually an interesting question about the United States because um, there's been no affirmative effort to keep out to keep out foreigners, um, but there's absolutely no barrier to, to foreigners uh, accessing made in any of the U.S. states legal barriers, right? There's always the practical barrier. You have to find a consulting and a, and a, and a prescribing physician willing to treat you. But um, every, every state, every one of our 10 states has a residency requirement. Um, but the way we define that requirement is very, very easy to satisfy compared to the residency requirement in Canada. So all you need to do is show, for example, that you own or rent property, right? So you can go on a, you know, the newspaper or Craigslist or something, find an apartment in Los Angeles, you know, send, send, send a check. And now, now you rent property in Los Angeles. That makes you a resident of California for purposes of the May of the end of life options act. So very, very easy to become a resident in the way that the law requires. So anybody, you could come from Scotland or, or South Africa and show up in, in Cal and I would, I mean, I'd say California is the biggest state, but it's, so it's going to be easier to find a provider than showing up in Maine. But um, yes, so I, I think there is no barrier to foreigners. Actually, I don't know that we, I don't know that it's happening. I haven't heard reports of a lot of uh, uh, tourism, but um, it, I don't see any legal barriers. Okay. Um, we have a, a question around capacity again um, from Johnny Ludvigson, and it's around capacity with regards to depression. So how do you know um, that that isn't transient and that it could be treated? So I assume that's for me. So uh, the, the, the question of depression and capacity uh, is obviously comes up a lot in, in my work. Um, the presence of mental health disorders does not in and of itself um, uh, make someone ineligible for care in Canada right now. That, that might be changing. Um, so uh, for sure, when people have concurrent mental health illness and other uh, physical illnesses that might be terminal, um, the occasion to proceed with MAID is certainly presents itself. The question about if someone has an acute depression, and, and I believe that their uh, capacity to make a healthcare decision for themselves is uh, is um, affected due to that mental health state, then of course they can't proceed. So how do I make that determination? That's like asking me how to do my job. Uh, it's not a simple answer except to say I make those decisions every day and and all physicians do. It's not because I'm an assessor of, of capacity for me that I have a special skill. I would argue that every clinician who offers a treatment to a patient is constantly, even sometimes unconsciously, assessing the patient's ability to understand what they're offering them their capacity to choose to accept it or not, or not accept that treatment, every surgery, every medication, everything. So it's a skill that physicians build over time and with experience and, and learn in medical school. If I have a patient who I believe, uh, if I can't tell if their capacity is impaired, I will seek out consultation. Uh, and, uh, and there's no limit to how many times I can do that. And I'm also aware that capacity can fluctuate. There are people who are very well and become aseptic from an infection for whatever reason and become delirious. And for a time, they certainly do not have capacity to make decisions for themselves. But that may resolve and they may return to their baseline again. So I think it's, um, it's, not, a, uh, it's not a decision that's made and then forevermore in that state. It, it has to be constantly reassessed. And that's why we, we reassess and look for capacity again on the day of the death, actually. We need to reassure it's still there. We, we're having a debate about this in the United States. So most in most jurisdictions, it's just two physicians, the attending physician and the consulting physician have to determine that the patient has capacity. Normally, neither of them are mental health specialists like Stephanie. Um, but if either of them is not sure about the patient's capacity, then they must refer to a mental health specialist, a psychologist, a psychiatrist. Um, but in Hawaii, the, the that third clinician so you already have to have capacity determined by the prescribing physician by the consulting physician in hawaii you automatically everybody needs to get their capacity assessed by a mental health specialist automatically not just by referral and some institutions at not because of the law just at the at the health system level decide you know what we're going to require a, a third capacity assessment by a mental health specialist not required by california law but we're going to require that. And so there's a debate about how much oversight and how much vetting 
um, sh we should have with respect to, to assessing capacity. So it's one of the things that there's variability on from state to state to state in the United States, and even from institution to institution to institution, even within a given state. Yeah, it's it's um, very dependent on, on the jurisdiction. In Scotland here, in our first attempt to change the law, we had a mandatory psychiatric assessment, and we actually took evidence from the Royal Colleges of Psychiatrists, and they said, you don't need this, capacity is presumed. So in our next attempt, we removed it, and we kept in that if there were any question, then there could be a referral. Um, we're coming to the end of our time around the Q&As now, so I've just pulled out some of the themes which are basically around how we engage people who are opposed to this. Um, there's a lot of questions coming through around um, religion, but given that we have a medic and an academic here, it's probably more useful to, to ask the last question um, to you, Stephanie. And there's one here from Julie Lang, which asks um, how we can basically view assisted dying as a continuum of palliative care and how we bring people who work with those at the end of, the li of life into this discussion because um, in most jurisdictions they, they aren't willing to engage with it. Yeah, it, it's a little bit the million dollar question and I, I think it's a, it's a matter of frame. Uh, it's a difficult question I don't have a perfect answer to I, I, and, I, and I think part of that is my own bias but you know, as a physician, I feel very, very strongly that no matter what I do for patients, no matter how I offer them treatment or what I offer them or what they do and don't accept, the truth is my role as a physician is to help patients, right? It's patient-centered care. And, um, you know, I might have a, a patient with a gangrenous leg and I might suggest that she have that leg removed in order to save her life. That patient may decline to have the leg removed. It's not up to me to force or not force a decision on a patient. It's for me, it's my job to explain the repercussions of each treatment option as clearly and as, uh, as effectively as possible and to them to support my patient, whatever her decision is. There's, there's that expression with to, to care, to, to cure sometimes, to cure sometimes, to care often, to comfort always. I think it's how it goes. And so that's it's really at the core of what a physician does. And so when a patient has end of life options in front of them, it seems to me it's almost malpractice not to offer what are the legal options at end of life. Um, and so I, my frame is that as physicians, it is our job to, to present options in a way that can be heard by patients and clinicians alike. It's a continuum of the exact same spectrum and it's very difficult for me not to see it in that way. Um, I understand other clinicians do not, so I need to work very hard at that and try to meet them where they're at. Um, and be very respectful of everyone's personal opinions. But like other issues in medicine, personal opinions are great within everybody's own household. Personal opinions and moral values need to be checked at the door of the threshold of your medical office. Um, and what happens in your medical office and with your patients needs to be professional and uh, to the highest degree of medical care. And I believe that means offering all the options available. Uh, so I just, that's the route that I go as gently and as politely as possible. Okay, great. Well, that rounds up the, the Q&A. Um, just to say thanks so much to everyone for coming along today. I would point out that we do have a recording of today's webinar. It won't include Paula's video, but it will be made available on member sites, as well as the World Federation's new website. And I would encourage you all to go and have a look at the World Federation's um, newly built website. So thank you to our panellists and to everyone for attending today. Hopefully one day soon we'll be able to meet in person and have our conferences together again. Um, but it has been great to bring everyone together tonight or this morning, wherever you are. Um, and I, I have been filled with hope with these discussions that we've had, particularly since March, um, of hearing of personal stories and shared experiences. And it really drives um, the work that we do here in Scotland and I'm sure for other people who are on, on the webinar tonight, it gives us hope knowing that you guys have passed the law and that you are helping people to have a peaceful um, end of life. So thanks again to everyone. Stay well and I will close the session now. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.